at them. So you might be wondering, what are the books? Well, these are the books. The first one, John Mark Comer, The Ruthless Elimination of Harry. I told you you'd get why you said I was convicted when I read the first page. The Ruthless Elimination of Harry. And that's really where most of the series is based on. The other book that, I, that this is sort of born out of is When Church Stops Working. Now, I'll be honest, this book was one of those that I saw the title and thought, well, that's a bit of an interesting one. I have no idea what that's about. Let's get it. And I got it. I'm only about one or two chapters in, I'll be honest with you on this one. But again, this picked up themes that this one picked up on. And it just really made me think, this is perhaps what the Lord is asking of us at this time. As you know, I've been on a retreat this last week on my own, in, and we are going to be looking at silence and solitude later on. And I've really sensed the Lord speaking clearly because I deliberately took the time away to spend time with God. And Steve will tell you, because we had a video call on Tuesday, I got totally lost in, what, in these woods and ended up by a river. And as I stood by the river, I was reminded of a picture that Martin Shea, the vicar at St. Hugh's, gave me about two weeks ago when I met him for lunch. We were praying, and he said, I've just got a picture that I think is for you, Tim. He said, you need to rest by the river with the Lord. I got to this river. There was not a soul in sight. And I took a picture and sent it to him and said, guess where I am, Martin? <laughs> and he sent back saying, wow. Be blessed, brother. It is amazing how God works in us and through us. And those pictures and with the confirmations we get, little did I know that I would be sitting by that river and hearing from God very deliberately. So over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to be going through this series. So today we're going to look at a diagnosis. And I'll explain more why when we get a bit further on. Then next week we're going to look at Jesus' invitation to us as Christians. Silence and solitude. We'll then look at the desert, the Sabbath, and simplicity, and slowing. They're not all S's, thank goodness. I'm not being too Anglican today. John Mark Comer, who wrote the book himself, says, It feels like the world is running faster than ever before. We're in a digital age where news is available 24-7. Burnout is at the highest level it's ever been. People are working more hours than ever before. There's more family breakdown than at any other times in history. And when we're asked, how are you? The answer is usually, I'm fine, just busy. I'm busy. Clergy chapter when we meet with each other. How are you doing today? Fine, I'm just, it's a busy day today. I'm sure we all know that. If we're at work, how is work going? It's fine, I'm really busy at work today. How's home life? Well, it's really busy because I've got this job, that job, and that job to do. We're all guilty of saying we're busy. So I've developed this series following these two books and being convicted myself about looking at a rule of life. What is a rule of life then? Well, John Mark Comer says it's this. It's a common understanding of how we follow Jesus together in such a way that we are transformed into people of love and offer that to the wider society. It's a common understanding of how we follow Jesus together. That's what the rule of life is. Well, what, oh, you develop a rule of life. There's not one set rule of life for everybody. But I get the sense that this is about looking together understanding how we follow Jesus in this church so that we can become people of love and offer that to the wider society, which desperately needs love. So it also fits our building blocks. The second one, love one another. The rule of life, or a rule of life. I believe the Lord is wanting to speak to us, friends, about transforming the way we do things. And to do that it means taking a long, hard look at the culture and society around us and looking at how we do things differently. The world is not going to slow down. In many ways, it's only going to get quicker and quicker and quicker and busier and busier and busier, and we are going to be more and more hurried than we are now. 
We live in an era where there's an entertainment overdose. If I was to say to you 10 years ago, I binge watched an entire series in three days on Netflix, you would go, binge watched? What's that? If I was to say it to you now, I've binge watched an entire series in three days, you go, oh really? Well, it only took me two. We live in an entertainment overdose. There is about, there's so many different things you can watch, uh, different streaming services. There's the internet, there's books, there's magazines. There's all sorts of bad stuff on the internet as well. We live in that era where we are just completely saturated with stuff to do that actually we end, most of the time we end up sitting there doing nothing. Or we sit there watching TV, playing on our phone, and planning things that are to-do list in our heads. Let's be fair, we're all like that. The mobile phone and the internet are probably two of the biggest culprits. Ten years ago, if you were queuing for coffee, if you were an introvert like me, you'd be looking at the menu hoping nobody spoke to you. If you're an extrovert, you'd be striking up a conversation with the person next to you. What happens now when you're in the coffee queue? Coffee. I'll pay on my phone. Thank you. We've lost that art of conversation. We've lost that art of what it means to really be human. And that's partly why I think we need to look at this developing a rule of life. We need to remember, friends, that we are human. And that means we are made in the image of God. So I want us to take a long hard and probably difficult look at our own lives over the next few weeks and see how we too can slow down in an ever hurried world. You might think, why are we doing this series now and we're doing freedom in Christ in our groups? Well, I believe that the two go hand in hand. Freedom in Christ is looking at ourselves and our own relationship with God to be a better disciple looking at conflicts that we've got, and how do we resolve those with God? Whereas I think this series is hopefully going to be looking more at the wider picture and culture and how we can be countercultural and different as Jesus taught us to be. We are called to live a different life. Now the purpose, friends, is not to make us all into nuns or monks and hide away from everything and say, actually, we don't want anything to do with the outside world. That's not what Jesus is asking us. That is a calling for some people, but I don't believe he's asking us. It's about learning to use what we have at our fingertips in a way that helps us develop our discipleship to become more Christ-like. Now, since Facebook began, the term friend has been hijacked to mean someone that you might have met once at a work function or a meeting, or it's someone who you've met in the pub one time. There is a huge shift in our culture away from what a friend is. The idea that you send someone a friend request and they become your friend is so alien to what friendship truly is about. It's a whole new ball game with social media and our discipleship. And it, and it actually reflects how we use it, reflects on us as a person. I know we don't all use Facebook and that's okay. I'm not saying we should. But I spent time at college doing my dissertation on this subject. It's a subject I'm really passionate about. And I'm not going to bore you with the dissertation. But if you want to read it, you're welcome to. But as I was reading, as I was sort of researching that, the books that I were reading were things like Reclaiming Conversation, Being Human, How to Flourish in a Virtual World. Indeed, a book that came through my door yesterday is talking about how relevant Holy Communion is in our modern society. Because it's so different, is Holy Communion, to what anything else that happens out there. Because we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ to share in bread and wine and remember what Jesus did for us. So I've titled today, Diagnosis. And hopefully that is correct. Before we go any further, friends, I think we all have to acknowledge that we are in a crisis. Whether that's personal whether that's the church, whether that's the nation, whether that's the world, we are in a crisis. In When Church Stops Working, the author makes the point that when we have a medical problem, we go to the doctor. 
And if we're honest now, probably we've done a Google search beforehand and we've diagnosed ourselves and we know that actually we've got this really, really bad condition. Let's say the problem we have is with our kidneys. You'd probably expect to go and see a doctor and then get referred to a kidney specialist. That's what Google will tell you. But what if the kidney problem is actually masking another problem and actually it's something to do with our blood, say? We'd be annoyed because it wasn't what we thought because we'd misdiagnosed ourselves. And I think that's the problem with the church. We have misdiagnosed ourselves and we're just dealing with the plasters and pulling them off and putting another one back on rather than actually getting to the root of the problem. So we need to take a step back and look at that diagnosis. There has been a huge shift in society in recent years. There is a shift between the sacred and the secular. No longer are they as intertwined as they used to be. We've also separated out public and private so much more. And that has led to it feeling like the church no longer has an influence in society. Now, maybe we don't. But we are the Church of England. We still have bishops in the House of Lords that can have an impact on the legislation and how this country is governed. We still have a place in the public sphere. Indeed, if I go back to COVID, the local church was in every community in the public sphere saying, we are here for you. We will help you. We have a place and we can bring the sacred and the secular back together because they go together because without the sacred out there is hopeless we have to take what we know about Jesus into the community so we have to stop being just faithful people in private and be faithful people in public what are the two things you're not supposed to talk about politics and religion no, we need to be talking about religion. I don't like the term religion, I prefer faith, because we're people of faith, we're not religious. We need to be talking about our faith in the public sphere. Because then people might start listening to us. But what we've got to be careful is not to be judgmental. We don't go out there and say, repent or you're going to hell. We go out there and, and just have a conversation with people. We don't bash people over the head as the old term is Bible bashing. We don't do that. We just reflect Jesus in who we are and how we go about our lives so that we break down that public and private barrier and the sacred and the secular once again. It means, though, we have to look at adapting and come up with new ways of doing things. Following, if, I, if we haven't diagnosed what we need to do, how can we expect it to change our behavior? If I go back to when I had gastritis in the summer, Amanda and I had to change how we eat following that diagnosis to try and avoid it happening again. I was diagnosed with gastritis. That was the condition that I had, and therefore we changed our habits. So the church needs to be diagnosed so we can then change our habits too. Now this is a quote from John Mark Comer's book. There's a lot of text, and I'm going to read it out. He says, it's been proven by study after study there is zero correlation between hurry and productivity. In fact, once you work a certain number of hours a week, your productivity plummets. Want to know what that number is? It's 50 hours. Ironic, because that's about a six-day work week. One study found there was zero difference in productivity between workers who logged 70 hours and those who logged 55, 50 or 55. So could God be speaking to us through our bodies? What do you notice about that quote? Who else did a six-day week and rested on the seventh day? Who are we made in the image of? I'm sure you all know the answer. Are we trying to push ourselves too much so that we are no longer able to rest? But not just rest sitting in front of the telly, not just rest reading the latest fiction book or catching up on Facebook, but to truly rest in the presence of God. We'll come back to that later on when we look at the Sabbath. But when we're busy, we're always in a hurry. 
And it is an enemy to our spiritual life. And I think that's what we need to name. That hurry and busyness are an enemy to the spiritual life. Now I realize, friends, that I have to look at myself long and hard here. Because I know that I got too busy here before summer. I know that I was doing too much. Particularly over these last two years with Hannah and Joseph, my time has been divided and stretched even further and even further. And then when I was ill with gastritis, I had to stop and I realized just how tired I was and how many different directions I was being pulled in. Maybe you might say, well, this sermon series is all about you, Tim. Well, it probably is because I never just preach to you. I preach to me as well. But I sense the Lord using that gastritis to me as a wake-up call to slow down and prioritize. And interestingly, since I've started to work in this new way, following this book and some of the practices he talks about, I'm able to get more done to a better standard, and I've slowed down because I spend time with God first, and then I prioritize things. So if I spend time with God first, it allows me to focus and apply my mind to the task at hand rather than trying to do one thing while thinking about the other ten I need to do and forgetting the five that are actually the really important things that I need to do. I believe it's a bit of a wake-up call for us that God is saying to his church, we need to unhurry. We need to slow down. We need to rest. We need to wait on the Lord in expectancy. Because we're not very good at it. We're not very good at waiting. In essence, friends, that's one of way of reading the parable we had today. It ser- should serve as a warning to those of us in church, particularly those of us in leadership roles. We're not going to get any extra reward in heaven if we've worked far more hours in the church than the person sitting next to us. It's not, it doesn't work like that. We don't get a wage or a reward with God. God doesn't want us to be busy all the time. He is just making a covenant with us in which he promises everything and he asks in return everything of us. And when God keeps his promises, he's not rewarding us for our effort, but he's doing what comes naturally to him through his overflowingly generous nature. Shock horror. God does not want us to be busy with church meetings every day of the week. He doesn't want us to be spending every spare hour studying the Bible. That's what the world thinks we do. You might have seen those memes on Facebook, what I think I do, what the world thinks I do, what my parents think I do, all all the different things. But to do what we need to do, we have to start with God. We have to go back to the basics and give our lives to God in all that we do. I am in a ministry Because God called me to ministry. You will be in your role, whether you are at work at the moment, whether you've retired. You will have done that role because you were called to that role by God to make a difference to to that workplace. I receive a stipend from the church so that my family and I can manage without me having to work a job. It's a way of life is ministry. We need to develop a way of life, of being ministers in the public sphere. I've said it before. You guys probably spend more time with non-Christians than I do. You guys are on the front line. It's not me. You have so many more opportunities than me to witness to people day in, day out. In your job, though, what does God want you to achieve? Or in your retirement, what does God want you to achieve? Lots of people say when I retire, well, when, I, when they retire, they're busier than ever. Does God want you to work so hard that when you get home, you see your family, you're too tired to engage, you snap at them and you go off to bed. And then you're still working so hard that you can't actually sleep for the next two or three hours because you're thinking about all the things that you haven't done and all the things that you need to do. That's not what God wants from us, friends. He doesn't want us to be that busy. He doesn't want us to snap at our friends and our family. He doesn't want us to not pick up the phone and see a friend or talk to a friend. We all live a busy lifestyle. 
Those of us with mobiles on social media, it's a dopamine addiction because we have to respond to it immediately. Your phone goes off. What's the first thing you do? You take out your pocket and you look. Oh, well, I've got a text message. I need to respond to this right now, this moment, even though I'm actually having a conversation with a physical human being that is more important. Amanda and I have a rule in our house that the phone is not even on the table because if I'm having a conversation with Helen over a coffee and I put my phone on the table between us, instantly that takes priority over Helen. We don't use our phones. Shock horror. You do not need to respond to a notification straight away. Since reading this book, I've changed how I use my mobile. I've now got all my apps stored neatly in folders. I've removed the ones I don't use. And my phone automatically blocks notifications between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. So I physically cannot see those notifications. So if you text me after 8 o'clock, don't expect to reply till the following morning. If it's urgent, it'll still come through. Don't worry. But I think, friends, that is a symptom of society at the moment. And I believe through being convicted by God and reading these two books that it's time for the church to speak into that area and say, you're busy, you're stressed, you're hurried. There is another way to live. And that way to live is by following Jesus Christ. Perhaps we're caught up in society striving to make a name for ourselves. Maybe we need to assess how we spend our time and where we need to make changes. To do that, we need to do three things. That stopped working. We need to make a head change to know that hurry sabotages our ability to give and receive love with God and others. We need to make a heart change to feel a desire to slow down matching the rhythm of life that Jesus modeled. And we need a life change, which means managing our daily activities in a way that makes space for loving God and loving others. It's quite a change. But I challenge you to make a change. Because I believe if we start doing what God is asking of us and working in this way, we will really start to see fruit for the kingdom. The early church would often spend time waiting before they did anything. Just waiting on God. What if we as the church learned to wait on God? What if we stopped and waited for him to show up? You might think, well, waiting on God's a waste of time. Why would I sit in God's presence for an hour when I could be doing all of these other jobs? Waiting is countercultural these days. It's different. If I'm in a waiting room, I get fidgety, particularly when the appointment starts running late. I look at my watch and think, well, what, how is this going to affect the rest of my day? But when we wait on God, we soon find that we can slow down and it is time well spent. It is time when the pressures and busyness of life start to melt away. And perhaps our anxiety over what needs to be done melts away as we discover afresh that it's God that provides for all that we need. It's not a waste of time. You might say to me, well, I haven't got time to spend weight on God. Rubbish. You have got time to wait on God if you have your priorities right by making a heart change, a head change, and a life change. As we come to a close, I'm just going to talk a little bit about hurry sickness, and then we're going to wait on God. We're going to wait on him. Hurry sickness is something that's been looked at by psychologists and medically shown that it has an impact on ourselves. Now, you might be sitting there saying, What's hurry sickness? I don't have hurry sickness. Well, there are 10 symptoms to check. I'm going to put the 10 symptoms up one at a time. And then we're going to wait on God looking at those hurry symptoms. This isn't to convict you. For, this is to convict you, should I say. But it's not to shame you. 
Because actually, if we are not convicted of the problem, how are we supposed to deal with it? That's why today is called diagnosis. We need to diagnose the problem, which is that we are too busy. We are living in a hurried world. We are too caught up with society. We need to look at these things, and then we need to say, God, I am sorry for where I have gone wrong. It is time to start afresh. I am going to wait on you. I am going to become the change to this community. I want to break down that barrier of public and private. I want to break down that barrier of sacred and secular. I want to be a person of love that loves my brothers and sisters in church and that loves my society that you have placed me in. That's what we want. That's what God wants from us. He wants us to be people who love one another and who love society. When Jesus sends out the disciples, he doesn't say, go and talk to the churches. He says, go into towns. Go into villages. And if they say, I don't want to know, just brush the dust off your feet and carry on. Yet in the 21st century, it's, well, I'm not sure I want to tell my friend about Jesus. Hopefully we're convicted. I was very convicted. You might just be sat there thinking, Tim's just preaching to himself. I am, friends. I'm not trying to say I've got it all sorted. I'm just trying to say this is what I believe God is saying to his church in this moment. So the symptoms. Irritability. You get mad, frustrated, or annoyed too easily. Little things irk you. People have to tiptoe around your ongoing low-grade negativity, if not anger. For this, don't look at how you treat a colleague or a neighbor. Look at how you treat those closest to you, your spouse, your children, your roommate. Guilty as charged. Two, hypersensitivity. All it takes is a minor comment to hurt your feelings. A grumpy email that you receive and a little turn of events turns you into an emotional ruin and ruins your day. And minor things, like you break a pencil, quickly escalate to major emotional events. Guilty as charged. Three, restlessness. When you actually do try to slow down and rest, if you've got the time, you can't relax. You give Sabbath a try and you hate it. You read scripture but find it boring. You've quiet time with God but can't focus your mind. You go to bed early but toss and turn with anxiety. You watch TV while simultaneously checking your phone. Who's with me? You fold your laundry while you answer emails. Guilty as charged. Number four, workaholism or just non-stop activity. You don't know when to stop or worse, you can't stop. Your drugs of choice are accomplishment and accumulation. This could show up as careerism or just obsessive house cleaning and errand running. The result, you fall prey to sunset fatigue where by day's end you've nothing left to give your loved ones. They get the grouchy, curt, overtired you, and it's not pretty. Guilty as charged. Number five, emotional numbness. You don't have the capacity to feel another's pain, or your own pain for that matter. Empathy is a rare feeling for you. You just don't have the time for it because you live in a constant feud. Number six, out of order priorities. You feel disconnected with your identity and your calling. You're getting sucked into the tyranny of the urgent, not the important. You're busier than ever before, yet you still don't feel you have time for what really matters to you the most. Number seven, lack of care for your body. You don't have time for the basics. Eight hours of sleep a night, daily exercise, healthy home-cooked food, minimal stimulants. You gain weight, you get sick, you regularly wake up tired, you don't sleep well, you live off uh, industrialized food, caffeine, sugar, processed carbs, and alcohol. Guilty as charged. <laughs> Number eight, you, ha you display escapist behaviors. When we're too tired to do what's actually life-giving for our souls, we turn to our distraction of choice. Overeating, overdrinking, binge-watching Netflix, browsing social media, surfing the web, looking at porn. Look at this, what is your preferred cultural narcotic. Guilty as charged. Number nine, slippage of spiritual disciplines. The groan. If you're anything like me, when you get over busy, the things that are truly life-giving for your soul are the first to go. 
rather than your first go-to, such as a quiet time in the morning, reading scripture, praying, Sabbath, worship on a Sunday, a meal with people you care about, and so on. So instead of a life with God, we settle for a life with Netflix and a glass of cheap red wine. It's a very poor substitute. Not because time wasted on TV is the great Satan, but because we rarely get, done any, we rarely get anything done binge-watching or posting to social media or reading Five Guys. We just feel awake and living for the sake of it rather than being refreshed, rested, and ready. And lastly, isolation. You feel disconnected from God. You feel disconnected from others. You feel disconnected from your own soul. When you're with friends, you're on your phone. Or you're a million miles away in your mind running down your to-do list. Who's convicted? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. We're not alone, friends. That's the purpose of sharing that with you. We're not alone. But we need to reject any shame that we're feeling. Because that's not what God wants us to do. Because we are hidden with God in Christ. His posture towards us is not based on our performance. That's not why we're doing this. But I think we need to agree that this is the new normal in the Western world. That's the root problem. That's the diagnosis. That the Western world has a problem. And we need help. We need help. So, we're going to wait on God. I'm going to leave those 10 symptoms on the screen if they're helpful. Reflect on them. Ask God to show you where things are not quite right. It's not about shame. It's about diagnosing the problem. And then next week, we see what Jesus says about all of this. And as we wait, Adam's just going to play really quietly. And we're just going to wait on God and see what he wants to do.